This is war. War and its masses. War and its men. War and its machines. Together they form the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. The big picture is a report to you from your army, an army committed by you, the people of the United States, to stop communist aggression wherever it may strike. The big picture traces the course of events in the Korean campaign through first-hand reports of our combat veterans and through film taken by combat cameramen of the armed forces and produced by the Army Signal Corps. These are the men who daily record on film the big picture as it happens, where it happens. Today we'd like to show you what patrol action in Korea was like. You'll see the return of refugees to the city of Seoul. You'll see an infantry attack on Hill 1179. And later, we'd like you to meet two Signal Corps combat cameramen, Corporal John Romanovsky and Sergeant Les Marks, two of the many cameramen who filmed the big picture in Korea. Now for part of the big picture, let's go back to July 20th, 1951. From 20 July to 20 August, the truce talks at Kaesong continued to hold the Korean spotlight, with limited ground combat resulting in only minor changes in the battle line. A small UN offensive above Kum Hwa reduces a red bulge and straightens the Allied line in the central sector. To the east, continued pressure by 8th Army units gains several miles north of Inji and Yanggu. As truce negotiations threaten to break down, UN commanders are alert for any movement by the Red forces, which have been greatly strengthened in men and supplies during the period of the Kaesong conferences. In an action typical of our current hit-and-run tactics, an infantry patrol infiltrates through enemy-held territory in the rugged hills northwest of Inji. Short advances are made into hostile regions to locate red outposts by drawing their fire. Once the enemy positions are pinpointed, the unit maneuvers to concentrate its fire and saturate the area. After inflicting all damage possible on the red positions, the patrol will pull back within its own lines. Near Hong Chon, a communications team gets final instructions before moving out to install another link in the very high frequency radio telephone network. The VHF stations are necessarily located on high ground since the radio beam is limited in its range by line of sight. Mountain tops, high peaks or ridges, though difficult to reach, are the preferred sites. During the last stages of the climb, Pack mules captured from the Chinese communists will carry the heavier, bulkier equipment. Because of its relative compactness and light weight, the VHF radio telephone equipment 
has proved extremely valuable in combat area communications. It is easily and quickly assembled, and problems created by unusual terrain features in wire laying are eliminated. During operation, a VHF station can handle four telephone channels simultaneously. Receivers and transmitters are carried on A-frames to the site by Korean civilians hired for the trip. Antennas are set up on the highest ground in the site area to obtain the maximum range. When the mast has been fitted together and guy lines attached, it is set into its base and raised into position. The antenna operating on a directional beam is carefully oriented in azimuth. A coaxial cable is connected with the antenna and terminated in the transmitting station located close by. Coaxial cables for both transmitting and receiving pass through the central housing. Antennas for transmitting and for receiving are raised and guide as the installation nears completion. More supplies are moved to the station by an ingenious system of long lines and pulleys, a saving in time and manpower. Gasoline for the generator units, which provide the electrical energy for the station, food and water for the crew, are all hauled up the pulley shuttle system. The newly activated station is ready to make radio contact with another unit. Messages sent through the radio telephone channels pass from telephone to wire to switchboard. The carrier then separates messages into one of four available channels which are transmitted by the VHF radio. At the receiving end, the messages follow the same channels to reach their destinations in the field, from radio to carrier to switchboard to telephone. After a series of checks and servicing adjustments have been made, the station is considered installed and ready for operation. It provides another link in the very high frequency radio telephone network and will contribute its part to the efficiency of our combat communication system. At an 8th Army Quartermaster Supply Point in Korea, refrigeration vans arrive to pick up frozen meats and vegetables. Railroad reefer cars transport the frozen foods to railhead supply depots, where huge refrigerated vans pick up the food for delivery to ration dumps in the forward area. A compact refrigeration unit housed at the front of each van maintains a constant freezing temperature inside the food storage compartment. These refrigeration units operate dependably and efficiently under the most adverse conditions, over rough roads and in all kinds of weather. The entire operation of delivering perishable foodstuffs to frontline troops must be conducted with precise timing. Delivery schedules are rigidly adhered to in order to prevent spoilage. Trucks from the fighting units coming to pick up supplies for their messes must also meet the schedule or delays and traffic snarls result. When loading of distribution trucks is completed, they move right out, heading for their respective outfits. The nutrition and palatability of these fresh foods are a valuable morale builder for the combat troops.
In spite of the driving July rains and the tough uphill going, American riflemen renew their attack to secure Hill 1179, north of Yanggu. Previous attempts to take the hill have resulted in failure. Fiercely defended enemy positions force the troops to dig in preparatory to an all-out attack. The unpredictable Korean weather has proved to be as troublesome as the Reds themselves. The drive toward the hill is supported by self-propelled 155 millimeter guns. With the aid of artillery spotters and information obtained from patrols, the big guns from this forward position concentrate their fire on known and suspected targets. coordinate their fire in the assault. Surface and air bursts clear the way for the riflemen. Strongly entrenched enemy positions are successfully eliminated from the path of the Allied advance. Creeping barrage, a heavy mortar company joins the assault on Hill 1179 in a continuous bombardment of 4.2 shells. From firmly established positions in a nearby valley, the mortar company supports the attack by lobbing their shells in on the hill just ahead of the infantrymen. C-119 flying boxcars drop ammunition and supplies as the UN unit reorganizes after the hill is taken. Airlift operations are necessary to reach the inaccessible hills of Korea, such as this, whenever supplies cannot be readily brought in by vehicles and other standard supply methods. As the peace talks continue and the United Nations line in the north becomes stable, a mob of exhausted, rag-clad refugees swarms back toward Seoul. They gather on the south shore of the Han River, hoping to cross and return to their homes, which they abandoned when the city was last left to the enemy. Not all have returned. Thousands have died from hunger and exhaustion along the road. Exposure to weather and disease have taken countless others. Most of the refugees must be turned back because of the serious food shortage in Seoul. For the present, only farmers and their families will be allowed to re-enter the city. Military authorities must check the papers of everyone seeking to return. Children, orphaned or separated from their parents in the confusion, shift for themselves. The screening process is a heartbreaking job. Most of these people have walked hundreds of miles to get back and have waited for days to have their papers examined. Those authorized to enter the city receive typhus injections. With the city's facilities destroyed, every precaution must be taken to prevent the spread of disease. As the screening goes on, the refugees who have been processed start for the river. Burdened with their families and the few possessions they have managed to cling to, they plod across the sand to the boats that will take them home.
There have been many delays, but for those who have reached the boats, the long journey is almost over. The outlook is still grim and uncertain. The city is in ruins. They will find their homes nothing more than heaps of ashes and rubble. But at least it is hope and a possible end to the months of aimless wandering. The refugees allowed to return to Seoul are fortunate compared to those who must be left behind. For these unhappy people, like thousands of others wandering through Korea today, there is not even the small comfort of a home in the ruins. During a tank infantry patrol north of Yanggu, an enemy box mine puts this allied tank out of action. A crew member is injured in the blast. Cautious probing reveals another box mine nearby, which is carefully deactivated and removed. The men gather materials to aid in bracing the tank as a tank retriever is ordered up from the rear. Mud and rain, the universal enemies of the soldier, slow down the work. The crippled M4 will be hauled back to maintenance shops in the rear, where skilled repair crews will quickly put it back into action. So this is the last program of our big picture series. And on this last show, it's appropriate that we introduce two men who gave you a good deal of the film that you've seen in the past 13 weeks. Two combat cameramen of the Army Signal Corps who were in Korea. We'd like you to meet Corporal John Romanovsky of Chicago, Illinois, and Sergeant Lester Marks of Providence, Rhode Island. Well, now, John and Les, you brought the Korean fighting right into the living rooms of America with your film. And I think these people out there would like to know just exactly how you did that. Uh, you saw all the combat units in Korea, didn't you? We sure did. Covered just about everyone there is. Uh-huh. Now, when you went up to the front, what, what did the infantry think of seeing the men with cameras up there? Well, they, uh, they were sort of amazed to uh, see a man up there with a camera and not a, another rifle. They, I uh, guess they never expected to see us up there, but we went up and got our shots and uh, they, I believe that the infantry gained a new respect for the Signal Corps cameraman when they saw us coming up there. Well, the infantry, I guess, was kind of a bit of a ham anyway on top of that. You'd be up alongside them taking your pictures with them, and the guy would turn around and look at you, and, what's the matter, you crazy? What are you doing up this part of the world? <laughs> As if we, we don't belong there. Well, it meant, it meant a good deal of their morale, didn't it, Les? Oh, it certainly did. You'd uh, be taking pictures of one squad, and, uh, and if you'd, they'd feel slighted if they didn't take pictures of squad number two, because... They all want the pictures. They all want their mothers and fathers to see what's going on back home. Well, they knew that the story of their unit was getting home. Isn't yes, it? they sure did. Mm -hmm. Well, now, how did you men get around? Uh, by jeep, mainly. We'd uh, travel all over the place, scrounging food off one unit and gas off another. And sometimes we'd live like kings, and sometimes we'd just bunking with the infantry on their foxholes. Uh, we also did a lot of hitchhiking and a lot of walking. And a lot of the walking was uphill, and it always seemed that when you'd get to the top of one hill, there was that proverbial other hill ahead of you, and it was sort of rough. Well, John, uh, what, what equipment did you use? Well, uh, we used the 35-millimeter uh, combat camera with the uh, short focal length lenses. We could have used telephoto lenses at times, but uh, it takes you too far away from the action, and you don't get the proper mood. That proves so, you were uh, right up there. You get get in there and you get your shots. And, and 
some weight to this thing, John. Yes, sir. There's two weights, what we call. One when you're going uphill and another one when you're coming down. <laughs> well, what other equipment did you have with well, you? We had a... Uh, carried our musette bags with uh, 1,500 to 2,000 feet of film and rations if we managed to scrounge some and uh, your caption books and pencils and we also had a uh, 45 caliber pistol mm -hmm. which was very similar to our short lenses. We had to be right in close if we ever expected to use it. <laughs> well now you went out on patrol with these men very often. We sure did. Uh, in fact I sort of made a specialty of it. Uh, some of, the, some of the patrols is routine and others are a little spectacular. I can recall one instance where I was out with this patrol and I got ahead of the patrol somewhat and uh, uh, the commies sprung a trap on us and uh, they wounded about three or four men of the patrol and so I hit the ditch and crawled back to my jeep, turned my jeep around and uh, well, I stopped by the patrol. They immediately piled on top of my jeep on top of the hood, that is, and I scooted down back towards our own lines. As was passing into our own lines, uh, there's a few newsreel cameramen there. They took pictures of us entering our own lines, which was news for them, but not for the Army. Well, you got the picture out, even though Marx didn't take it. Huh? Oh, yes, I sure <laughs> did. Well, now, you saw a lot of firefights over there, too. You were right with them then, weren't you? We, we sure did. We saw uh, firefights when we were with the infantry, and we'd go out on tank patrols and stuff, and we saw got artillery barrages and snipers and received some mortar fire also. Right. Speaking of mortars, I recall another incident here. Uh, I was on patrol with the Marines here and uh, we was going along the road and uh, infantry, a mortar barrage hit us. We hit the ditch and uh, I didn't have a steel helmet with me and my buddy with me, the cameraman, did. And they was hitting right above us throwing debris on the top of us, and I'd try to get in under his helmet without much luck. Just didn't make it. Just did didn't you? make it. Just couldn't <laughs> do it. Well, now, uh, did you ever have a chance to use these weapons you mentioned, John? Yes, I did. I uh, managed to shoot 130,000 communist troops. 130,000? Yes, but of course we were using uh, cameras, and they were POWs. Oh. <laughs> well, John, uh, in just a few moments here, we're going to see the truce talks at Khe Song. Now, were either one of you men there? Well, John was. Yes, I was fortunate enough to get into Khe Song and uh, see, the, see and photograph the truce talks before I managed to get back to the States. And uh, I got there, and there was a communist photographer taking pictures and a similar camera to ours. And uh, he was taking pictures, but he had his lens cap on, you see. And, uh, Consequently, he wasn't getting any pictures, and he, when he'd finished, I walked up to him, and I tapped him on his shoulder, and I pointed to my camera, and then I pointed to his, you know, and he saw the lens cap on there. <laughs> he saw the lost face. He didn't think but much of them as photographers, then. No, I didn't. I didn't think much of them as uh, photographers or fighters. Well, let's see these scenes. The truce talks at Khe Song through the eyes of some very good photographers, the men of the Army Signal Corps. On 27 July, at the Kaesong Truce Talks, the Reds agree to an agenda, leaving the question of withdrawal of foreign troops to political conferences. The most important question still to be settled is the military demarcation line. Tape recordings are made of the discussions. British and Australian communist correspondents Alan Winnington and Alfred Burchett cover the talks with the Red delegation. Red propaganda posters appear even in Khe Song. With the meeting at an end, General Nam Il and his Chinese colleagues leave to report to their superiors. The convoy of United Nations negotiators returning from Khe Song find themselves isolated when the Ponton Bridge over the Imjin River is washed away during one of the many unpredictable floods in the area. An attempt to rescue an army captain marooned on one of the pontons is made by helicopter. Too weak to hold a line let down to him, the attempt is abandoned and a small boat puts out to rescue him. Personnel in the isolated convoy were airlifted by helicopter to Munsan in a two-hour shuttle operation. 
As the peace party leaves Munson for the August 5th meeting, the agenda question of a military demarcation line has yet to be settled. At Khe Song, Admiral Joy and General Craigie hope to meet the Reds on more amiable terms. They are in for a rude shock. In direct violation of the terms laid down for the truce talks, the communists have unaccountably permitted a unit of 83 Chinese soldiers in full battle dress to enter the neutral area. Fully armed with mortars, rifles, pistols, and submachine guns, they make their camp within full view of the conference headquarters. An allied photographer is threatened away by the commander of the red unit. The shortest session to date was terminated by Admiral Joy after seven minutes during which he accused the reds of the violation. An empty conference room symbolizes the gulf between communism and democracy. Admiral Joy reports the neutrality violation to General Ridgway. The UN negotiators are called back to Tokyo. General Na Miel, with a sheepish smile, apologizes for the incident. After the meeting with General Ridgway in Tokyo, negotiations are resumed. A possible subject for discussion, a change of sight for the truce talk. With this program, the Army concludes its 13-week series the big picture. You've seen the men of your army in Korea, how they fight and why they fight as well as they do. Because they're the best trained, the best equipped, the best led, and the best informed soldiers in the world today. But remember, Korea is only part of the big picture. Everywhere throughout the world, in freezing Alaska, in torrid Panama, in distant Iceland or Japan, Hawaii, the Philippines, in Europe, as well as here in America, that soldier is on guard against communist aggression. And he's ready to fight back against great odds, just as he did in Korea. When you see the uniform of the United States Army, remember, that's your uniform. And the one who is wearing that uniform has pledged his life for your country, for your freedom, for you and your loved ones.